Hey, everybody, welcome in. It is time for another episode of Three Guys Before the Game. And if you are scoring at home, that would be episode 195. Wow, five away from the magical 200 mark. Here we go. With the Senator Brad Howe and the Dean Hoppy Kerchival and our special guest on this episode, Mountaineer basketball assistant coach Ron Everhart will join us. Today's program being brought to us in part by Comax Business Systems, your full service Konica Minolta dealer. Go to Comax Business Systems at ComaxWV.com and why not now? More so than ever, people are working from their home, as you all know, so you need the absolute best when it comes to managing your IT services, managing your voice services. That's what Comax Business Systems done, does 24 7 remote monitoring. Gives you the peace of mind that your business can keep on businessing. Always has your networks back. Visit them at the website, comaxwv.com. That's comaxwv.com, and they will give you that lifeline that you need. Also, this episode brought to us by Burdett Camping Center, the only warranty forever RV dealer in all of West Virginia. Visit them at burdettcamping.com. Hello, hello, men. How are we? Hello, Hi. guys. Proceeding? Just, right. uh, Everyone's doing all right? Another day. Yeah. Moving along. Another day in a new world. Yeah, right. Is. Very different. Very different. We'll talk more about that uh, coming up on the program. And uh, we are delighted to be joined on the show. Um, I want to call, let me think, how can I term, how can I, I'd say this guy is the most, wow, I almost said, I don't know, let's just bring him up, WVU basketball <laughs> assistant, Ronnie Everhart. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's I was a heck of an introduction. No, here, here was the deal. I was going to say, and I want Ron to get involved, I was going to call him the most colorful of the Mountaineer assistant coaches, and then I said, no, you can't call him colorful because you got, Hugs is very colorful, so I, you, I, I had to pull that one back. Yeah. And yeah. I was going to say uh, most interesting uh, – that probably ain't going to go. Um, Just bring them on. I would say the mo- – yeah, I did. <laughs> how, about the most, how about the most textured? I mean, because this guy can talk. Think about what we could go with with him. We can, talk, oh. we can talk Marion County, and we can talk West Virginia until the cows do come home. We can talk about his career, player at DeMatha, played for legendary Morgan Wooten, played at Virginia Tech. Coaching stops. He's like the resurrection guy. He goes and just takes program, built programs up, right? Um, from down in Louisiana to Northeastern. JJ Berea came into the Coliseum, knocked yeah. off West Virginia. We go Duquesne. Not Nineteen and ten for JJ Berea in that yeah. game, and we're gonna, I want to get into that one. Yeah, with we'll talk, we'll talk about that. that. For, yeah, you know, you know what though? The best, the best part about that was Marcus Barnes had thirty-one, and every one of them was a direct result from Berea's. <laughs> Great vision, you know. He made he just put it on his chest. So it was that was an interesting day. Now hold on here. Did did you just off the top of your head reel off that Marcus Barnes had thirty one? Are you looking at the box score like I am? How'd you just do that? No, no, no. I just remember the game pretty well. well I guess. No, this, have you talked well, seventeen have you years any, ago? Have you ever spent any time with Rain well, Man? I worked with him. I he's, know him. He's Rain Man. <laughs> seventeen years ago, he gave you Marcus Barnes thirty one. Dude, the stuff that's in the in his head. If you hooked up one of those machines. Where they like, where they can see your brain and like the hot spots, he'd be like, they'd look at him and go, "There's something wrong here." There's you're something you're wrong. underplaying what he just 19 did. Nineteen offensive rebounds that night too. Excuse me. Phil Robinson had nineteen offensive rebounds too. Yeah, we, we we had a great game that day. Do you remember the final score? Uh, uh, ninety some, eighty some, but yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't remember the exact numbers. Ninety-one, eighty-four. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Ninety-one, right around it. That's he's really seen a couple well games. Done. He's Jeez. seen a game or since two, then. Three. Yeah. It was 2003. What year was that? 2003. 2003. Poor Coach Beeline still. That was, that, Poor Coach Beeline still wondering that was what the heck. 2003. It was. Uh, it was right around the Thanksgiving break because uh, you know Frank Martin was my assistant coach and it was the first time he'd ever been in West Virginia. Period. So because he's, he's he was a Miami guy his whole life. So we we had an interesting trip here and uh, my parents of course were all up from Fairmont and we we had a we had a big time and my brothers and the whole thing. So it was a it was a real neat deal. Was that so? Here's a, here's a kid that grows up in Fairmont. You become a coach. You come back. I mean, you you grew up obviously so intimately involved with WVU hoops, although didn't play here, but so intimately involved to come in here and win on that night. What did that mean to you? 
You know what, Tony? It, it was it was it was obviously like any road win in college basketball is a great win, but it was really special here because I grew up here. But the, the interesting thing about it was was that it's almost one of those deals where you come into a game like this and you don't want to win because you know West Virginia fans are the greatest fans in the world. You got all of your families. You know, it comes to root for your team, and they're wearing damn blue and gold with WV on it. <laughs> so it's like it's, it's almost like uh, you know, it's almost like beating your brother in a backyard game of wiffle ball. You know, you don't really want to beat him, but you have to, or you or you do, or you you have the opportunity to. It's one of those things that uh, it's just uh, kind of a, a weird, uh, a, a very satisfying and gratifying thing, but a very weird thing because you know you. you you hate playing against the Mountaineers in anything when you're when you're not when you're not here. So did you get harassed, um, or were people yelling stuff at you? Yeah, but that was no different because <laughs> when I played at Virginia Tech, the same thing well, happened. Well, that's true. And it kind of felt the same way when I came in for for those games. You know, what was that like? Because I'll tell you what, poor Bimbo Coles, uh, he had some of the worst games of his career when he came to play at West Virginia. Yeah. I mean, the fans were unmerciful, and he just for whatever reason he went sideways. How did you do when you did play here? Not the same as Bimbo. Not well. Too much. Not very good. Yeah. Not very good. I looked and at you. And you know what? I, I had a, I've, I've had a really interesting basketball career. I uh, I played for, um, of course, my dad was sort of my everyday coach, and he was terrific. But uh played for a guy named Mark Sestito in junior high, who was, who was great. Uh, then went to high school and played for a guy named Bill Reppert, who was tremendous. And Bill was a legendary coach in Marion County for, for many, many years. He coached my uncle, Ronnie Retton, who, who played here at WVU uh, he, at Fairview High School. And then he came to West Fairmont High School. He coached my father, and he coached me. And uh, he was really good. And then, you know, I had, I had a great opportunity my senior year to, to be able to go up to uh, probably the toughest decision I've ever made in my life, to leave West Fairmont and go up to DeMatha High School and play a year for Coach Wooten. And um, – it was it was it was an interesting, uh, I, I guess, time in anybody's life, you know, where a lot of things are happening. And um, I just remember how great it was, you know, growing up in Marion County, being around sports all the time. Um, I was probably one of the few guys who knew about some of this stuff because there was always something going on, you know. And in the in, in the in the summertime, there was the uh, Twilight League down in Fairmont, which I don't know a lot of people know about, but you know, we had great players come to Fairmont every summer and play in the Twilight League. Uh, a lot of the WVU guys, uh, all of the Fair Fairmont State guys who had great teams. And you know, Coach Retton had a great team. And um, I lived right by the college, so I spent a lot of time with Coach Retton. I knew those guys very, very well from a young age. And uh, then, of course, my father, Ronnie Retton, Bucky Boyer, they all had a team that was, was terrific. You know, the, old, the older guys back then, you know, who uh, – you know, they took the young college kids and beat them up pretty good because they knew how to play. So it, it was a really neat deal because every summer you'd see not just good games but great games. I remember Fritz Williams came in and played for Joe Manchin's team and uh, was terrific, you know, made big shots. And, you know, it was, it was one of those things where you saw that in the summer. And then you could go over to Baxter and they had the, um, you know, the corporate uh, fast-pitch softball league, you know, and uh, – Mike Arcuri and Ronnie Retton played for R.W. Cable. You know, you had uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, which were, you know, all, all the Italian guys from Pennsylvania Avenue who were really, really good. All those guys, Nicky Colantino and Davey Manella and those guys. So it was, uh, it, was, it was great. Every summer you had a chance to see, you know, great ba baseball or, or, or soft or fast pitch softball or, um, you know, the, the Wait Twilight a second. League and basketball down there. So it was, it was a really, really great place to grow up for anybody who was involved in sports, that's for sure. Let me ask you this. So the senator had his own – Joe had his own team. The senator yeah, back then yeah, had his own furniture. team. furniture. Yes, he did. Yeah, so what, – now what, hold, hold on before he goes further. Yeah, what? He, he just gave us two sponsor names of fast bit <laughs> softball teams from 40 years ago. <laughs> Do we charge him for that? Or Here's what price? I don't want anymore. No more, hold on here. Here's what I don't want anymore. No more social media posts from Oklahoma about how Lincoln Riley can recall plays from 40 years. Oh. He's done. Ronnie goes right. No more Sean McVay <laughs> stuff. No, Ronnie's Ronnie got just that. gave you team sponsors from adult fast pitch softball leagues. Yeah, two. I mean, you, you, we're only scratching the surface. So wait a oh, second. Oh, no, I, I tell me a few more too because they were, they, that that was a team filled with with I mean, it was a league filled with great teams. Uh, Kalo Motors had a team out of Grafton too, and they were they were tough. I mean, they they had really good teams. Whenever in that you play Kalo Motors, yeah, you got to know. Yeah. You're so what year one. was this, Ronnie? This oh, God, my entire childhood. Some would say. Uh, Early seventies, early sixties, so, early seventies. So what? What was so? Did Joe play? Did the senator play? 
basketball? Yes, yeah. he did. How, how was he? What was his game? He was good. I mean, he, Joe, Joe was a good athlete, man. He, he, was, he was tough. You know, he uh, obviously he was a football guy, but uh, he, he played bas- basketball every summer. And, so was uh, he an inside guy? I mean, would he post up back to the basket? What was, what was his game? No, he was sort of a wing guy. He could make shots. Oh, he ran down the floor. Did you see her that, Hoppy? He he told me a story one time, Ronnie. Maybe you can try to confirm this. He said that he got in a game and and punched somebody (laughs) and that his dad or the coach made him go to the school of whoever he punched and apologized to the whole school. He told me that. Are you sure this wasn't Huggins or Catlett? No, this was Joe. Oh, Uh, you you know – See, I, cause I never saw I never saw him play or remember him, you know, back like in high school and stuff. But I know when he was older, playing in the Twilight League and stuff. I know, you know, he was playing in. in, in I mean, I, I tell you, the, the league was really good, guys. It was like a, a like a G League type of thing today. I mean, these these guys could really play. They were they were guys who were really good players. Uh, you know, like my father and the Conway brothers were guys that were like, you know, NAIA, uh, all America type guys, you know, and, and, and they, they, they were really, really good and played on really good teams. And they played for a long time after college because that was their, do you know, the recreation, that's what they, they all did. So they, they, they had really good players in that league. Do you, uh, I remember you, Ed you... Lemon and, and Lerman Battle and guys from Fairmont state that were really good players playing in that league. And they, they were tough. Do you know. Because it was about the same time. He, I guess about the same time. But you didn't go to Fairmont State, but you knew all those people. Do you know yeah. uh, Bill Lindsay? Who played oh, I watched Fairmont. Bill Lindsay play probably every game he ever played and at home. You, you know, might yeah, know him, Bill yeah. Lindsay, Lerman Battle. Van, do you know Vance Carr? Well, Dave Cooper. Vance but Carr? That, Vance Carr? Vance Carr. That was a great team they had. They, that, that, that team was as good as any team in NAIA basketball. Those are Charlestown guys. Bill yeah. Lindsay and Vance Carr That's went right. to Charlestown High School where I went. I knew them. I knew them back then, and they went to Fairmont. And yep, had great careers. And and both I think went to Europe and played. Wow, they were. That they did good. both play in Europe. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they 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 were they were really good. I, I remember as a as a kid at their basketball camp. I remember watching Bill Lindsay work out. I mean, he really worked at it. Yeah. And I'll never forget Joe Retton walked over and he goes, okay, guys, I just want you to understand one thing. He goes, if a guy that's that good has to work that hard, how hard do you think you have to work to really be good? There you go. And it was kind of one of those things you just never forget because he, as a kid, you're looking at him, you're saying, oh, man, this guy is really, really talented. He's big, he's strong, he can play. And then for have a guy like Coach Retton come over and say what he said, it was just kind of um, – it was pretty uh, – mind opening at that time in your life you know it's like wow he's right you know you can't ever work too hard you know that, that was kind of what you took away from that thing hey ronnie but those guys were really good how many d1 kids were on the dematha team you played on you went to tech obviously who was the best player on the dematha team if it wasn't you um that's always the big argument when we get back together and we were able to do that here with coach wooten's funeral recently um the, the the big argument was was it me or Adrian Branch was it was it was it Kelvin Johnson but um, we had uh, in our in my senior class uh, Adrian Branch was on your team yeah Adrian Branch was on my team oh. he was a junior Went I to was Maryland. a senior Bob, Went to Maryland oh yeah yeah was a great player at Maryland and, and now he's he's a, he's a bad broadcaster as I tell him <laughs> at, uh, ESPN did you all beat did you all beat did, did, what was your rival uh, Mackin uh, Mackin was really good. That was Johnny Dawkins. Yeah, they, they were good. Uh, Joe Howard played at Carroll. Um, <sighs> McNamara was good. I'm trying to think who, who in the league. Oh, Tom Sluby at, at Gonzaga. We beat them four times that year, once in the Alhambra finals. And I was the MVP of the Alhambra tournament. And that was sort of, in my brief recollection of my high school basketball career, that was sort of like the highlight of my career, being the MVP of the Alhambra Catholic Invitational Tournament in Cumberland, Maryland. That was a uh, a great tournament. Could but you? Tom have... went to Notre Dame, and uh, Joe went to Notre Dame too, and played football and basketball. Wow. Uh, from from Carroll, he was a punt returner and a and a guard on their basketball team. But uh, that that was it was a really good league. Obviously, uh, Tommy Amaker was playing over at Woodson. We played them in the preseason. He was yeah. just a freshman that year. Ain't that something? Hey, Ronnie, if you okay. Yeah. Let's do the. Do you think of this. Think this question through. Okay. Based on how people train today and the food that they eat today and what we know today, take Ron Everhart and your skill set and ramp yourself up with how people train and everything like that. 
could you play today? Uh, that's a great question, Tony, because it's always uh, you know, predicated on the guys that I played against and, and what we all did in college. And, and, and even, even you know, w- with me playing with uh, Dell, who was a 15-year pro at, at, at Virginia Tech. Uh, that's Dell Curry, for I, those I not following. Dell Curry. He's yeah. gotta, he gotta, did his kids ever play? Did his kid? Did Dell's no. kids ever? He they never, have, never, he, he, never any good. No. He, yeah. Well, I, I tell you, the, the interesting thing about it is, is I, I, and I've, I said this to Dell, um, they they're, they're pretty good because of him, but they're really good because of his wife. His wife Sonia was an All American volleyball player for us at Virginia Tech. She's from Radford, and she was really really good. Oh, I didn't realize she was originally from Radford. Why did you let Del Curry yeah. take all the shots? I mean, Curry. I'm looking at the stats here from your senior year, and Del Curry averaged 18 and a half. A guy named Perry yeah. Young, who played one oh, year yeah. in the league, averaged, uh, averaged 18 and a half. You averaged four. I mean, why'd you let them take all the shots? Yeah. Uh, selfless. He's selfless. Selfless? Is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, that's part of it. And part of it was, was I really didn't have a choice. <laughs> 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 Cream rises you know, to the top. Here, here was the deal. Yeah, I went from a guy who was dependent on the score my whole life to going to a place like that. And them saying, listen, the only way you can get on the floor is to pass the ball to Dell and guard the other team's best player make foul shots at the end of the game, and then you can play a little bit. And that's what I did. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's why, hey, and that's what you're asking kids to do nowadays, right? Just that's do right. what you that's can right. do, you know, try to do. Accept no- your role. Yeah. Yeah, accept your role. Yeah. Kid, are kids so easier? I mean, I, you know, answer your question. I, I'm thinking about that now because it is an interesting question. I, I, would, I would say to you this. I, I would be, uh, you know, probably a little bit uh, remiss if I didn't mention the fact that I got, I got injured my first year at Virginia Tech. It was a bad injury. It was a back injury, a lower back injury on a fall. And Jack Brodigan, who is, uh, you know, of course, runs HealthWorks here, um, was our was our athletic trainer back then. And uh, I didn't think much of the injury really. It just kept me out for a year. Then I came back, and I never really thought I was as good, as athletic, as bouncy, as fast. Mm-hmm. Um, as I was prior to that injury. So I, I, I think the answer is is before. I was injured. Yeah, I think I could. Yeah. I think I could play today. That's interesting. And I think I think I, think I could have been a pretty good player today. I really do. <laughs> I don't, and I, I don't the doubt reason, that. The only reason I say that is because now, there, now there's a three point line. There was no three point line then. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get in a? Man, I'm not even. I forget that. I'm not. I was going to ask him if he ever got. <laughs> was, I was going to ask. Did he ever get in a fight in a game? Because you. How am I going to say Probably. this? How am I going to say this? The Everhearts. Um, they are known for not walking away from any situations. Is that a fair way to say that? I was better than my brother, Tony. I could tell you that. <laughs> I was better at that than my brother was. Yeah, you've, you've cleaned out a few. Or, or both of my brothers for that. Yeah, you've cleaned out a few bars in your days. But anyway, so that's good. I mean, at least hugs. I mean, hugs actually did. You you probably didn't. So that's that's a good thing. That's a good thing. The situation that we're in right now, Ron, is obviously something that no one has ever uh, gone through. Give me your perspective on how you're staying in touch with the kids and what isn't happening now that uh, that normally would be and how you're dealing with it all. You know, Tony, that's so hard, man, because, you know, you just try to stay in touch with the guys you can when you can, and, and some days – uh, you, you catch up with them. Some days you don't. It's, 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 it's a really, really tough deal because, and you guys know this as, as, as uh, media guys. I mean, you guys still there? Yeah, we're, we're here. here. Yeah, we're good. Oh, my phone's beeping, and I don't know why. Oh, you using, uh, using a cordless phone? Another, this, this interview, this yeah, interview could be, phone. This got, interview could be coming them, yeah. real, switch, real short here. Well, that starts to beep. That's not good. That's not never good. Beeps are never good. No, be beeps are the way. Look for good. the look for the bench. Look down the bench. See if you got another one there. Yeah, Bring somebody got, else in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I got to do it quick before he, before the other guy gets in foul trouble. Here. <laughs> but make uh, the move. Make the move. Get him out with two. Get him out with two. Right. That's right. That's right. But no, I, I think the biggest thing is is you know, and you guys understand this better than most people. I mean, we're in a we're in a world where, um, you know, uh, I think. Uh, you know, every everybody comes together quite often. We 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 are in the furthest thing business wise from a social distancing uh, right. situation that anybody could ever believe. And now all of a sudden we're in 
a whole different world. So it, it, it's very difficult. Ron, when you um, look back at this past season's team, and obviously there's always going to be the question mark, you knew that this team was going to build as the season went on, and it did, and it hit the it hit some highs and it hit some bumps, and then it finished on a little little uptick, obviously with the last two wins. Yep. When you were, if you were to evaluate this season, is this the type of a season that you had expected? Now, take away the fact that the season never went into postseason play, but was this the kind of group and year that you thought it would be? Um. Yeah, tell me I do. I, yeah, I, yeah, I thought. It, it not, I, I think more importantly, it's what we. I thought it could be, because there's always so many questions. Having to rely on freshmen, you know, where where are we? Um, you know, I think early on when we went to Spain, we got some things sorted out, and um, I, I think they most importantly realized, you know, gosh, Deuce was going to be pretty special here, you know, because he does some things um, offensively and defensively that are really going to help us. And then, you know, I think filling in around Jordan and uh, Deuce and Knapp and the, and the kids that were, were sort of like designated as, as our one guys. And I don't even know if Deuce was at first because he might have been more of a two guy in thought. But in practice, it, he became a guy who was so good with the ball in his hands, you had to put him there. So I think, you know, and, and filling in around that with Taz and Sean and uh, – you know Emmett and everybody else. I think that, uh, yeah, we kind of we kind of we kind of flourished. And then up front, you know, you had Derek and, and Oscar, and Oscar was, you know, uh, you know, he's just one of those kids that uh, you know God reached down and said, you know, you want to be a great athlete. And now, you know, what you do with it is up to you. But you're just a great athlete. He he has been terrific. Great work ethic. He explodes. He runs. And obviously, we have been able to depend on him. Uh, inside if, if to, to rebound the basketball for sure. So, um, yeah, I think our team has developed into, uh, um, at least right now as we speak, and like you said, we had some bumps in the road and we've um, ha- had a lot of different things, good and bad happen. But it's, it, to, to me, it was a great year and especially a great year when you can bounce back and say, hey, you went from losing 21 to went to winning 21. Mm-hmm and had things played out, you would have had a chance to maybe make a run at this whole thing, and I really think we would have. Ron, you mentioned there, Oscar, and we spent so much time on, on this show talking about him and what a fantastic year he had, and, and as you mentioned, the, the obvious athleticism was still so much upside for that young guy as well. Walk us back, go back in time a little bit, and talk us through the first time you saw Oscar, the first time you met with him. How did that whole relationship start and evolve? <laughs> This this is this is a pretty uh, funny story actually. Uh, I was in Mount Mission uh, at Mount Mission School down in Grundy, Virginia. Um, for those of you who don't know what a- Mount Mission is, it's a, it's a school in Appalachia and it's been there forever. And it was designed to take kids in who were obviously uh, impoverished Appalachian kids and educate them. And it's gone from that to their their mission where. Wherever in the world there's been the need for that, you know, they've gone and gotten kids and brought them here, and they house them, they feed them. It's it's a it's an unbelievable place. It really is a, a, a cool place, and their mission statement is truly God's work there. And and uh, I've always enjoyed going there. And so uh, we're, we're we're sitting there, and I'm there obviously to watch uh, Magic Bender, who who played for us, and they're in there practicing and. Van pulls up and these kids get out and they come in the gym and kids get out in the street clothes, put on sneakers and go out and start playing. And this one kid is just, you can just tell he's going to be terrific. And, uh, you know, one of the assistant coaches at the time down there was a, a West Virginia guy who was, uh, a great guy. And he was in law school down there at the Appalachian school of law. And, uh, he was coaching over there and we got to know each other. And he said, uh, you know, what do you think? You know, these are the new kids that are coming. I think that guy's going to be really, really good. And he was, he was a freshman. He was, uh, you know, just, just got there that, that day. It was the middle of the semester. They, they, they got those kids out of there. They got them over here. And uh, I guess the kid in, in French asked another kid who could speak English what the logo meant on my shirt because I was the only guy in the gym. And, uh, of course, the West Virginia 
graduate who was the assistant coach there said, uh, that's West Virginia. It's the greatest place on earth. Uh, almost heaven, West Virginia. And the kid translated that back to Oscar in French. And from that day, the only words he knew for a while uh, in English language was West Virginia and almost heaven. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's a true story. It's, it, you can't make this stuff up now. I'm telling you. And, uh, of course, Hugs goes down there, uh, I guess maybe a week later or something. And uh, it, it was pretty pretty close behind there. And, of course, he walks in and the kid knows what West Virginia means because he sees Hugs' logo. And uh, I think Coach was pretty excited when, uh, you know, after watching the practice and him walking up and saying that he knew what that meant. So it was, it was pretty that, – that's how everything got started. And, you know, to the kid's credit, uh, the recruiting situation with him got uh, – like a lot of recruiting situations do with very high profile high school kids, it got uh, heated and it got competitive and, uh, you know, all the big boys came in and that kid, uh, to his credit, stayed loyal to coach Huggins, who he developed a great relationship with over the, the three or four year period that we recruited him. And, uh, um, he, he, at the end of the day, you know, with all the, when all the smoke cleared, he came to coach and said, I want to play for you. I told you that three years ago, and I want to come and play for Bob Huggins, and, and, and he did that. Coach, you all finished the season on an uptick, obviously, but there was that slump in February where you guys were just trying anything and everything. What was going on then, and what were you, th what were you all thinking internally about what was happening? I was, uh, like any coach, or I, I was concerned. Um, I think we all were as a coaching staff, but, but in the back of my head, I also thought that, you know, we've played so well at times our chemistry was so good at times, you know, you hope that uh, you could bounce back and bounce out of it. And I always thought we would, I was a little surprised it probably took us as long as it did, but I think some of that had to do with um, the fortunes of where your opponents fall on your schedule. I mean, we had some really tough games there and we caught Texas at Texas when they were playing great. Right. Um, but all that being said, uh, I, I thought a couple of things. I thought maybe, you know, we had some, uh, we had some guys who mentally, I think, just got tired. Um, Emmett, uh, for one, because he really started struggling making shots. Uh, you know, I think there were times when Oscar had hard time scoring over length. There were times when Derek couldn't make a free throw. There were times when, you know, our guards, who had been pretty good all year in terms of, you know, distributing the basketball, had hard times passing the basketball. So I think a lot of this thing had to, came down to mental fatigue. And I don't know if there's any documented way to say that that's a real thing. But, you know, as a coach for all these years, you can see a team – and especially a team that relies on younger kids, freshmen and sophomores, things like that, there is mental fatigue, and, and, and it's it set in. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I think what happens is it, go, it can go two ways. You know, it, it, can, it can really destroy your team where guys lose confidence. Um, or, you know, you can have guys who are strong enough in the locker room to step up and hold guys accountable and say, listen, guys, we're going to get through this. We're going to make this happen. And, we're going to continue to fight and work. And I think that's what our guys did. You know, um, I, I think, I, I don't know. Who did that? You said, did you have a guy, a locker room guy that did that? Yeah. You know, Tony, it's hard to go back and put a finger on. I mean, but, but if I'm guessing if it would have had to have been one of the freshmen or sophomores, you know, what was it? Derek Culver? I don't know. Was it Deuce McBride? I'm not sure. Heck, was it Taz Sherman and, and, and Sean McNeil? I, I don't know. But, but one of those kids decided in the locker room one day, maybe it was Jordan McCabe, you know, and, and very well could have been because Jordan's got a, uh, you know, a, a great way with our team and he's a good leader. Uh, but, but, but it could have been one of those kids in saying that, you know what, um, I'm going to get everybody together here. We're going to have a team meeting and we're going to try to get this sorted out. And then if we lost another game after that, you know, it didn't go south, and, 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 and everything was forgotten about. It was somebody strong enough to be able to pull everybody back together and say, we're going we're to make this work. And, and, and they did, to their credit. But I think that's what good players do. And, um, you know, you, you can look at guys 
backgrounds, where they came from, where they played in high school, the type of programs they've had, the guys who won and were state champion you know, caliber guys. And you could almost bet that those guys were the guys that helped get this thing turned back to where it was um, with obviously a great assist from, from a guy who's going to be in the, in the Basketball Hall of Fame one day in Bob Huggins. I mean, I think he was, you know, when you say, you know, the leader, that guy's the ultimate leader. You know, he's, 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 he's never going to run. He's never going to hide. Uh, you lose a game, hey, you know, this is what we did or didn't do. You win a game, hey, this is what we did or didn't do. He, he handles both the perfect way um, while coaching his basketball team and making them better. And I don't think if you look around the country, you can ever find a guy anywhere that uh, – you know, not only prepares to win and competes like Bob Huggins, but also handles when things don't go so well as as well as, as Bob Huggins does. And not that anybody handles losing well, because he doesn't do it well, but he does it with dignity and class, and he handles it like it's something that could happen. And, uh, you know, you go look at some of these other guys, and it's, uh, it's amazing uh, how well Coach does that. Ronnie, spin that forward then, because you'll go you'll go this past season from one of the youngest teams in the country to next year, assuming most of these guys or all these guys return, to one of the more yeah. veteran teams, a ton of experience. So where does that manifest itself the most? I realize it's in all these areas, but where does that help the most? Is it locker room? Is it in practice? Is it late in games? Where do you think that shows up, that veteran leadership? I mean, you know, I, I honestly think it comes back to that mental toughness thing. I think where it shows up, honestly, is, is, is when things really, really get tough and, and, and say, you know, one guy's struggling mightily, another guy's able to pick him up or step up in a game and do well enough to compensate for what happens when we lack here. And I think we didn't do that this year. So, for example, if, if Deuce McBride struggled scoring the ball and Emmett Matthews was, was having str- trouble shooting the ball, where did our perimeter scoring come, come from? Well, later in the year, Jermaine Haley started to kind of pick it up. But for a while there, nobody, nobody would step up. Now, you, you fe- be- rewind this thing back to where when we played in Cancun and when we played in, um, uh, at Ohio State or, or even the game that we lost up in the Garden to, to St. John's, um, every, somebody stepped up every day, whether it was Sean McNeil who made three straight threes in the first half against Pitt, um, did the same at St. John's. Uh, whether it was Deuce McBride who made, you know, pull up after drive after pull up after ball screen against Ohio State, you know, I I don't know. I think early in the year we were doing that. I think late in the year we struggled with it, and I think the last two games we found our rhythm again, and we were able to do that again. So somebody else struggled, somebody could step up. So I think that comes down to the mental fatigue part of it. And when you get get to be a little bit older, and guys have been through it once, I think you can go 31, 32, 35 games without that happening. And it may happen once, but I think you can go through a whole season without that happening consistently like it did for us for, you know, four or five games straight. A couple of really quick questions here from the Twitterverse. Have you ever coached in a game with a faster ejection than Jamie Smalligan's three minutes in 2007? (laughs) You remember that day? Uh, When he he hit Bill Clark uh, when I was at Duquesne? Yeah, 2007. Yeah, no, 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 I haven't. Plus, here was the worst part about that. And, I, and I, I mess with Small again all the time about this. Is you know, what Bill Bill was completely acting when he pushed him. Um, Bill Clark was a tough kid, re- really, really a tough kid, and, and, and a good player. So Clark jumps backwards, like to sell it, to, and you could tell on film to sell the push, and he did. But when he hit the ground, he 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 never like put his hands back or braced himself so his head snaps off the floor he gets a concussion and we lose him for 10 games and it really really hurt us that year i mean that, that was a that was a not a not not a it turned from a good deal where it was going to give us a chance to win that game into a really really bad deal uh where we lost him for 10 games and that was that? Uh, yeah that was tough how about that yeah. um ryan writes in you ever see yourself again as a head coach? I'm a Mountaineer in Boston. Loved him during his days at Northeastern. Came to practice a few years ago to observe. Couldn't have been kind. You couldn't have been kinder. Talked hoops with my staff, and was so welcoming. Awesome person. Oh, uh, he's he's awesome too. Uh, he coaches at a high school up there in Boston, and uh, they do a heck of a job. They had a guy this year that um, 
or last year, I'm sorry, that we, we probably should have pursued a little harder as a walk-on, but we had two local kids that we took. But uh, to answer the question, Ryan, I don't know. You know, I, I, you know um, I've got uh, – my parents are, are, are 82 years old. They live over in Cheat Lake. Uh, my dad's not doing very well because he's got Parkinson's, but uh, still watches every game, and he's a, he's a, a true blue mountaineer. Um, I, it's, a, it's a hard question. I don't know. You know, are there days you get the itch to go back and maybe do it again? Yeah, there are. Uh, there are also days you sit there and you say, man, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm working with a guy who's a, who's a legend. And, and I, I will tell you this for, for a fact, from a basketball guy, who, and I've been a lifer in this game, you sit there and uh, – I've been at the high level before. I mean, when I, when I finished at Virginia Tech, I went and, and coached at Georgia Tech for a year. I was a graduate assistant there, and we were number one in the country all year. Mark Price, John Sally, Bruce Dalrymple, uh, Dwayne Farrell, Tommy Hammonds. We had a good team. Uh, and John Sally, I'm sorry. So Mark Price, John Sally, and, and, and those guys. So uh, we got upset that year. Uh, LSU beat us when they had the, the, the miraculous upset to go to the Final Four. And, uh, of course, Purvis Ellison made two free throws to beat Duke in the championship game. Duke beat us by one in the ACC championship game. And, uh, you know, I, I've been at, at this level before, but it amazes me every day when I'm around Bob Huggins to, as to how good of a coach he is, how much he knows about the game, and how basketball educated this guy is. I mean, he just you – know, he, he, can, he can fix a guy's shot. He can make a guy play hard. You know, and, and he, he's he's done this for a long time, obviously, but he's done this for a long time, and he's been real good at it for a reason. So, I'm I'm a, I, I couldn't be more grateful for what Bob Huggins has done for me, or, or happier to have an opportunity to work here at West Virginia. So I don't know. Uh, that's that's a great question. I ask myself that question. On that note, we're going to cut you loose. Certainly uh, appreciate your time, buddy. Uh, great insight um, and a great reference to those sponsors back in the uh, back in the uh, <laughs> the fast pitch back league in, back in the days. We'll have to we'll pick those up one of these days. All right, brother. Stay safe, stay healthy, and Bye, we will see you around, man. All right, Tony. Thank you, Brad. Hoppy, you guys take care. All Thanks, right. Ron. I really appreciate you guys having me on. You bet. Thanks, Ron. There he is, Ron Everhart. I tell you what, when he is done coaching, I mean. You talk about sports talk guy, broadcast guy. Yeah, he'd be great. <laughs> Perfect. Be great. Right? Think again, as you said before we started this, we won't even we won't scratch the surface. We didn't get we didn't scratch the surface on this year's team, let alone when he coached Mark Price and John Sally. You know how many stories exist from just that particular team? Bobby Look how Crim good that team was. It was a criminals team, right? Goodness Bobby Crimmins. Right? Yeah, yeah. That was this guy. I mean, just uh, you know, just stories. Just, he just tells stories. And every – how many, and Tony, you've talked about this a lot. I think you've written about this. Everybody comes back to Marion County at some point. We're talking about coming back to West Virginia. I mean, the Marion County tentacles are unbelievable. How about Senator Manchin having his own squad, right? He had his own squad. Wing player, you know, put the ball in place. He said he could shoot it. I bet that Twilight League was fun to watch. I bet that got ultra competitive too, right? Oh, that's big boy stuff. Same deal in Charleston during the heyday of Rod Hundley and Jerry West. They had a massive league in Charleston. Like they would bring it. Now, think as crazy as this sounds. Like Bill Russell would come in and play games. Jerry West, while he was in the league, those guys would play games. When they were already in the NBA, they would play summer league games. I mean, just the stuff now that you would look at and go, what the what? Were they getting paid? Well, probably back then because they weren't making any money. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they were getting a taste. Because that's probably why you do it. Because yeah. you weren't making silly, stupid money no. like you do today. So you Coming had to find ways play. to make some money. Yeah, absolutely. Twilight League. Good Twilight League <laughs> reference there. There's one and there's Ironic. only. We got more the text questions coming up. There's only one dealer in the state of West Virginia when it comes to RVs that offers the warranty forever. And that is Burdette Camping Center located in Winfield. And here's how that deal works. No matter how long you own it, it's the only warranty forever RV dealer in West Virginia from the ceiling down to the floor. And you can be sure that your campers purchase no matter what brand, Puma, Wildwood, Rockwood, Coachman, any other brand, Burdette Camping carries that it's protected from the floor to the ceiling with the warranty forever protection. Check them out. See what they have. If you're in the market and thinking about an RV, it's the Burdette Camping Center. Visit them at BurdetteCamping.com. That's BurdetteCamping.com. Or you could also 
check them out on their three guys special deal. It's the three guys sponsorship deal offering a sweet special, a 177 BH Wildwood camper for only 10.9. That's a 177 BH Wildwood camper for only 10.9. Check it out at burdettecamping.com. All right. You guys ready to hit some questions here from the uh, texter verse? Sure. Are these uh, texts or voicemails? Uh, we're going to go straight, uh, text. straight text today. Okay. I saw one that I want to start uh, with episode number 200 in the near future, perhaps under the conditions. Are any special themes or ideas for special guests floating around for number 200? That'd be a what was today? 195? This is 195. Tony, you're the primary scheduler, so that's uh, that's all on you. I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I am. I mean, you guys can fire uh, 304-404-4083. 304-404-4083. I just want it, it may be difficult I've mentioned this before it may be difficult to um recreate the cake we had for number 100. Yeah. So if we have to delay that somewhere along the line yeah. a cake has to come into play. I would say so. May not be right at the 200th episode you know, but the, we need a cake. My choice would be a guy like Ronnie because and I, I know there are bigger names. I just like the stories, man. Just tell stories. Dude. That I mean when I tell people that's a scratch, you got no idea. He could do, he could do a telethon of stories. He could just go and come back in twenty four hours. He'd still be telling you a story. I still can't get over a name two sponsor from the fast pitch league, and and referenced how good the Grafton team was. Good good Grafton, <laughs> which team. I really like. That used to be a great train town, Grafton. Hello, a uh, hoppy question from the uh, text line: Which WVU college president has been the best to work with? Doctor Gee. Really? Oh yeah. So that's not recency bias. I mean, you're just, you've worked with them all the way back to, who's your first president? Who's the president well, when you I came was, to school I, here? When I came to school here, it was President Harlow, who I probably interviewed a couple times. I was a student, maybe working in the student newspaper. And, and they've all, I mean, I've worked with them all, and they've, um, President Hardesty was very good to work with. Got along fine with him. I've worked now. I've worked with Guy twice, though. So yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised by your answer. And and Guy is very uh, very accessible, and also he is quotable. Okay, so from a selfish standpoint, Guy will give you material. Yeah. So because I mean now it's the second time around for Guy. Yeah, this is this is a heck of a run. Might be the greatest second time return. You know, some guys go back. You know, in athletics, sometimes a guy returns to a team. Like they get comes rid of back. him and then they come back to it in a you know free agency comes back. His, this his second stint, I think his second stint hoppy has been more, uh, more valuable than his first. Stint. Well, his here's the interesting thing is that Guy had had been well traveled. He was at Ohio. He was at his second stint at Ohio State. Yes, and then there was controversy there because he made made that joke so he he left ohio state and he was just going to do some other things and then it, serendipitously this this wvu job opened up and it was a fit yeah and it, it it just was a fit and he loves being the president you know i mean he really does i mean he he lives it yeah, there's no question about that okay this is the other part of this question I don't think about it just say it i'm talking to you senator what's your first wvu memory First WV memory. Ed Hill. Really? 1993? Mm -hmm. At BC? Yeah, and I was actually working at Connecticut at the time. He caught the touchdown. The buddy of mine, for my roommate from college, back in Iowa, went to grad school here at WVU. Yeah. He came up to see me for Thanksgiving that year, said, hey, you want to go to the West Virginia-Boston oh, College Oh, you were game? there. Yeah, I was there. I was live. You were at BC? I was live. I said, yeah, well, I want to go because it's an hour and a half from, from Stores, Connecticut. We hop in my car. We have no idea. We drive up to Boston looking for parking, park in some supermarket lot, no hope we don't get towed, go in. The guy by the name of Tim Roberts, who sure. ended up preceding Tim. me, I ended up taking Tim's Oregon job. State. He's yeah, Oregon I, State. Oregon. For Oregon. A long time. I replaced Tim a couple of years after that, but he got us tickets, Went, sat in the West Virginia family section rich bram's dad was right behind us bud collins the old tv announcer did tennis sure wimbledon for years yeah just for some reason was in my row so i was bud live collins. for ed hill on the <laughs> touchdown catch that's my first earliest memory What's bud collins I was there. doing i don't know bud collins BC guy. i had to stand up oh, excuse, bud, bud collins guy. Comes by. excuse me I had to get okay just got to there's bud there. collins excuse me everybody bud collins walking by i had to get up did you, did you know it was him because he had a rainbow colored blazer on he didn't know he's no. dressed normally 
Yeah. Um, so two things. I, I'll give you my first WVU memory. You were there, I, sure, right? Well, yeah. So here's the deal. Here's how I had to get there. The night before, that was a, that was Black Friday. The night before, I broadcast Texas, Texas A&M in College Station, Texas. Coldest I've ever been in my life. Drive back from College Station to Houston in the middle of the night. Oh. There's an airplane strike. American Airlines on strike. I f- have to find a way to get to Boston. Find a way, go through. I go Houston. I don't even know where I went. Maybe through Atlanta. I get there about noon. Game was about a three thirty mm-hmm. game, mm-hmm. and spotted for Jack Fleming that game. Spotted for Jack Fleming on the road, and in that game, after West Virginia scored the Ed Hill touchdown, Woody O'Hara was doing the color, and Woody, as you remember, Hoppy had used to wear the bowl rings. Yes, bowl mm-hmm. rings about as big as a watermelon. Right. right? He gets on there and he's banging his hand on the glass <laughs> and the press box window. On the radio booth. And those BC people, the way that that's lined up, it's not like they're 30 yards down away from you. Their heads are on the back, and they turn around. Now, they just had the touchdown scored against them, right? And we're going to high step out of that They thing. probably turned and said, congratulations, we're happy for you. <laughs> they, they turned and gave a Boston welcome. <laughs> now, they did. Uh, my first WVU, real first WVU memory is when I was a, would be a, Senior. I'm a senior, West Virginia at Syracuse in the Carrier Dome. Haas is the quarterback. I get hired as a production assistant by CBS Sports to stand and hold West Virginia's team at the tunnel, and I was going to give them the cue to run out. Always an underrated tough job for the person tough that has job to do that. Because I, that was a wide-eyed experience for me. I never knew. I mean, it's like Bulls on a stampede they're and ready they're, to go they're ready to go they do not want to be held when like they're, ready to, go, they're and, ready to go and yeah and it's syracuse i mean it's a very thin tunnel so they're there now, this is how weird world is right life is so i so who's the first out kneeling mm-hmm. so don and i have no yeah that's the coach and i'm just say coach i'll tell you when i'll tell you when i'll tell you when i'll tell you when so they're they're ready they're ready they're ready. <laughs> well, back in those days, it wasn't wireless communication. So the producers on a headset with me, a little old headset, you know, crazy little thing, and it was a hard wired headset that the phone company would give you. It had a battery, like those big industrial batteries, smaller than a car battery, but about a half of a car battery. That was what powered the device that you were listening to. And the phone company also put a massive spool of cable. I don't know where they thought you were going to go. So I'm holding them back, holding them back, holding them back, holding them back, and finally they said, let them go. So I say, go. So they rip out. Real quick, did you hold your ground? This is important because, Hoppy, I've, I've done a release as well. We'll get into that in a minute. Did you go sidestep and get out of the way, yeah. or did you just hold and hope nobody hits you? No, 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 no. You Side cleared. St- oh, it would have been There's two over. techniques there. You yeah. can hold. I sidestep. It's the more dangerous of the two. But hobbies. after about 10, 15 guys came through, one of the – feet of the mountaineer players got a hold of the cord Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and it was like a cartoon that coil went <laughs> right and that battery just exploded into the air when it ended up it just snapped and off the battery went fortunately didn't land anywhere but that was my first memory of west virginia little did i know that it would be a year later and I would be in Morgantown. Did, if you do the if you do the release of the team long enough, you will also get some colorful language from the oh, people you're holding absolutely. back. When we when Rich first arrived and we moved to the inflatable helmet yeah, and the yeah. smoke, so I was down there for that. Right, the early time I had to walk. Okay, here's how we're gonna do it. Here's that smoke when it would get in that helmet would absolutely fill the whole thing. I mean, you couldn't see the first wave of guys just couldn't see. <laughs> I will always, for the rest of my life, remember standing at the front of the helmet, and I can't see anybody. I mean, they're only like a couple feet away from me, standing there, and all of a sudden, Rich's head just (laughs) pops. Like, the head just comes out. Brad, are we ready? And then a couple F-bombs there, like he was ready to go. All right, go, go. There we go. Go, 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 go. Jeez. So you should should see if you can get involved in that some point. The release of the team. Uh, I think I'm think I'm past that. I don't think I'll be. You're nimble uh, enough. You I, can I, move because you got to get. Tony's right. You got to sidestep quickly and get out of the way. I'd like to be the red cap one game. I'd like to do that. That's a nice job now because they have the digital sign. Uh, that's it's made the thing. Uh, that digital sign's the greatest invention in the world. People used to go, "How long is the timeout going to last?" And now they just goes out there and everyone goes like, 
33. Plus, I would nice. I would not be a wimp. I would go very far onto the field. Oh, Some guys, I go if you, I'd go out there. Yeah, stand out there. What's funny? I'm in sometimes. control. You wait, <laughs> wait for me. Yeah. What's um What's funny is that sometimes those officials. What's funny is when you see the guy going out there and the official doesn't see that he's out there, and there's that that that's always funny to see. Like, is he going to pick it up? And I mean, that screws you. I mean, it doesn't screw you the fans, but it screws broadcasters. If you take that break and then they don't give them the timeout, and all of a sudden they're playing ball and you're in a break. Well, that, uh, that certainly uh, that certainly succulates. Um, I had a question here, and I'm trying to find the doggone question, and it was really good. Oh, okay, here it is. Andy in Columbus. Ready? Would each of you get a tattoo of the three guys logo <laughs> on your forearm if it meant that West Virginia would win a national championship in either football or basketball at some point in your life Thanks, and I love the show. Would you get a three guys tattoo on your forearm if it meant that West Virginia would win a football or basketball natty? The forearm's a tough location. There was a time in my life I would have. (laughs) If I could be included on the national championship ring list, that may becomes a little more possible, but I I probably can't do that. I can't go forearm. I I I can't go forearm. I would consider – I don't have any ink. And I, you know, at my stage in life, I think, why would you do it now? Because you've gone this long. But I don't know about, like, your face and Tony's face and my, <laughs> and my Larry King well, face on there. I don't think there. he's saying the T-shirt design. I think you could just do the word mark Oh, I thought you were talking about the guys, like the faces. No, just what if just it's the word three guys. I, yeah, just the word mark. And you could either do it as the numeral three guys, because you know, we, have, we have dual branding here. You could also do the word three guys. You don't have to put our faces oh, on Oh, you don't there. have to put the faces no. on? No. All right, I'm in. What the heck? You would do it. Well, if it, if forearm, it, or would you insist on it being wait, somewhere wait, else? Right here? Yeah, or just yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why not? I would do. I mean, yeah. If if like I mean, to get I, the I, picture, I wait, you'd I, have I to, to do this, the the faces would have to be like your whole back. I don't know how this deal comes about though. Like you get the tattoo and they win a national championship because you could never claim credit for that. You could never tell anyone you're at the pool or something. You said, <laughs> yeah, I got. If I got this, they would win a national championship. Nobody would believe that. So. You'd have to be pretty self-actualized to, to go go in that direction. I've gone. I've thought about. I've thought over the years. I've thought occasionally about getting the flying WV. But I've, I've again. I'm going this far with that wow. ink. So that's pretty strong. I'm not doing it. So I could slip to the next question right now and get out of it without giving an answer. I don't know, man. I don't know. You're not an ink guy. I'm not an ink guy. Not that. I mean, I think some of the tattoos are really neat. Um, but I just don't have any. Um, see, I would probably try to. I'd make it so small. Just do it really super small. Get it on your neck. Yeah, my temple. If I could negotiate location, that would change. That would change my thought on that. Vic and Polka, the questions for Hoppy, the dean, I'd be and the if you had my senator. face tattooed on your back. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm That'd like, be great. Well, I'll tell you one thing. My, just like, how all, I just look at it like, oh, my God. I got to look at that like, every day. That's what I put on your back. <laughs> Vic from Polka. <laughs> <laughs> Second part of his question, how far along are they on the renovations to Milan Pushkar Stadium? It's a massive project. It's not going to be done until July of 21. So one year from this July. So they're just pretty much in the infancy. But if you drove by or saw it right now, it's just an absolute – you wouldn't recognize it in the fact that the front of the building, the facade, is completely gone. It's just really? plywood. Just complete ply- – the whole front of the – Pushkar Center is plywood. Really? Yeah. What, what month is completion? July 21. July. You ever notice that, Hoppy, sometimes? What? Old boys will say, yeah, I was coming there like we were in June and July. You ever that July? <laughs> Put that July down there. Senator loves when I do that. You like that almost as much as clown. <laughs> the clown, the clown calendar. The July is a good one. I bought your clown calendar? It said July. When you got there, it said July. Uh, the other part of the question is for the dean and the senator. What would an appropriate nickname for Tony be? I kind of think about that. I mean, you don't you don't take things like that lightly. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give that some serious thought. Uh, well, appropriate, subjective too, because yours at least makes a little sense when he says that. My, I mean, mine's not rooted in anything other than he just throws it out there. Yours is it's quite stuck. rooted. 
Max and Parkersburg, do you think the expected returning roster would be successful if the NCAA were to play a tournament at the start of the 2021 season? So there's some speculation. Was this Hugs? Is yeah, this speculation? Hugs's, speculation might be a strong word. Is this Hugs's brainchild? Like yeah. he's the only one that's pushing that. I, I haven't seen it anywhere else. So, <laughs> okay, Hugs to play a tournament to, to he wants start to the start season. next season with the national championship tournament. The only organization I think there are two organizations that I know that start a sport with their with their championship <laughs> Daytona mm -hmm. and Pony League Baseball in Europe. Pony League Baseball in Europe does that they start yeah, so championship. The Pony League World Series happens every year in Washington, Pennsylvania. The European team plays for the right to play in the World Series. Right now. Is that right? When their season starts in Europe, they play their World Series to determine who comes to the International World Series. Reason? I have no idea whatsoever. And Daytona, I mean, that's that's the the biggest race of the year, but it's not the championship. Right. I mean, you can win Daytona and not win the championship. Well, Hugs thought they could play the uh, NCAA championship to start next year. So you take the dollars from the you, you missed this year. And then you play it again next. I, I'm all for that. Left two of them. Oh, I'm good. I, I'm all for it. There's a lot of logistical things I think you have CBS to go through. CBS would be for that. I, I think. And I didn't get. Do, are you naming a national title, a, a national champion from this last season, even though you're playing it in the front? Is that the intent, or was it just to have another tournament? To have another tournament. So you. Be, but then the you have a team that tournament? wins that tournament isn't deemed the national championship from this past season. Let me put an asterisk. Yeah, because his idea was to let guys that have exhausted their eligibility come back and play in that yeah. to start the season. There were a lot of moving parts there. A lot of moving parts. But give Chance. me a tournament. Here's the idea. Give me a tournament to start the season in. There's some speculation, Hoppy. There was one idea tournament? floated. There was one idea floated. Play all year now anyway. I mean, play. There was an idea floated um, this weekend that said play college football February through May. You yeah. know how I stand on this stuff. That'd be weird. Oh, that I'm, I'm the yeah. advocate. I'm the guy. Let's play. You want to play in Wisconsin in February? Well, here's the deal. I'm the guy that has advocated for a 10-year player on a college team. You know I've always been strong with a franchise player. So in lieu of what's going on right now, I'm totally open for any creativity. You want to put the craziest thing that no one would have ever thought about, I'm totally in. Let's just go when the time comes. When the time comes. If it has, and everyone's healthy, everyone's safe, we're ready to play, I don't care what you do. I, you want to play, let's play college football on Sundays. February into May. Let's play college basketball on on Saturdays. Let's double dip. Let's double header. Let's double everything. I'm I'm a hundred percent with you, and I've said this when this all first started, before it was apparent what we were dealing with. The thought of playing games with no fans in the stands. Oh, that bummed me out. I did. You know what? Now whatever, whatever it takes. I'm with you. Whatever day, whatever time of year, fans, no fans, whatever. Play games. Get back to games whenever you can. If college, if the option is college football goes away for next season completely. Or you play it February through May. Give me February through May a thousand times out of a thousand. Joel is an alum. Joel, hold is, on, like, hold on. Kerchival's like, oh, I'm sorry. Gr he's grimacing. I'm sorry. Excuse me. No, why I, are you I just, grimacing? Well, I, I'm like you. I mean, I don't want to lose the season. I just don't know how you play in February. Hell with it. Just play. Why do you not? What do you? I mean, what are you confused about? You play in November now and December when it gets cold. Is well, that what you're not concerned like about? February and where you're from? February in Iowa. February in in uh, Michigan. February. Well, November and, and December are no treats in those places. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you go I mean, to the beach in December. You're well, just trading not. the back. I mean, a, a May no, game is no, pretty nice. No. NFL's pretty February nice. Hey, Harv. Hey, Harv. Hey, Harv. Hey, Harv. NFL playoffs all through January. Yeah. Right? I think, well, no, I'm going to stop. Three guys, stop. Joel, an alum in Atlanta. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> As college ADs now have to be more financially creative here forward, is this the time for the Big 12 to add two or four more schools? <laughs> if, if TV money to Power 5 schools is drastically reduced to each school. And is this the right time for the Power 5 to break away, form their own organization, policing administration, whether it's the NCAA or newly developed structure? Thank you. Good question, Joel. I think... We were, we were slowly moving toward the breakaway among the Power Fives to form their own constellation of schools and then go to the TV networks and bargain. Again, that's off, but maybe something like this, depending on how conversations and negotiations and things like that go. Man, you got a lot of moving parts for that to happen. You got to get a lot of people oh, sure. in a lot of different places 
rowing in the same direction, which happens zero times in college sports. I have a texter, long promised special photo, sporting what casual at work. The guy's got a guy's got a mask on and a three guys hoodie. Very nice. Thank you very much. What if, what if you just – now I'm just interrupting because I'm just thinking. And I, what, what if you delayed the start of the season and just played into mid-December? And don't have that oh, big – You might have, have to. And don't have that big lag oh, before bowl games. And then, and then You, you might have to. I'm sure oh, yeah, that's on Play until December 12th but, and then have a bowl game on the 18th. Well, and, right, but I don't think it's an either or what you're suggesting. I think the February comes in if they say you're not playing in the fall. You're done in September. You're done in October. You're done in November. And you're done in December. That's when the February comes in. I mean, the the, more, the closer you can get it to traditional football season is what you'll do. But if you continue to get health advice that says, hey, there's a second wave coming that's right. hitting in October, yeah. and you've got to back the thing up further, I think that's where February comes into play. What if you play through – okay, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, you're fine. Hey, guys. Hey, three guys. Whilst teleworking – Taking the offer on what Mountaineer to have as a guest, do the fact that you were contemplating the fantasy game of the 88 team and the Pat White teams okay. and seeing how the single pressing issue going into the next year is offensive line play. How about a guest, Kevin Koken or Danny Moses? Yeah, those guys are be awesome. Be great, either one. Perfect. Why don't we let's, – let's do – can we do this with, with social distancing? Why don't we get one of our video guys? Let's schedule a 40-yard dash or a 100-yard dash – between Pat White and Rashid Marshall. Can you set that up? That'd be a good race right now because Rashid is still in premium condition. Right? My, I, I've argued better condition than when he played. Yeah. Better shape. I would agree. And Pat, is Pat still doing anything at all? I mean, he's one of those guys that will be athletic forever. But at the same time, it's one thing to be athletic and bouncy-bouncy and compared to just – and there's a lot of discussion on who was faster in their prime. Rashid claims he was. Yeah, he does. He does. Can you? Wow, can we? That's blazing. Can, can we do that? Pat's not around though. He's he's coaching in South, South Florida. Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to come up with stuff. I mean, they're gonna have a they're gonna have a horse contest for the NBA. Why why can't we have a hundred yard dash of great players? <laughs> yeah. Um, How about Koken versus Moses in a one hundred yard dash? Koken versus Moses. Koken. Koken, You know yeah. what he became? He, he yeah, became yeah. a marathon guy. Triathlete. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. If you saw him now, it'd blow your mind. He's a triathlete. He looks like a like a receiver. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We gotta get, Koken's good. We got to get him on there. That'd be good. Koken, great story about Koken is the week of the Syracuse game to go 11-0. and 0, He was on crutches. Entire week. I mean, just, and I, I mean, using the crutches. I saw him and he was like, I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. He played. He played. Tell you another race we could do. We could do Dunlap and Doc Holliday. Because I don't think either one's in great shape. Doc, I tell you, what do you mean? No, whoa, whoa, Is Doc, in, Doc in good shape? No, for, I don't know about Doc. I'm sure Doc always, you know, Doc was a huge runner for years. Yesterday I was walking down the rail. Don't tell me Dunlap's in shape. Yes. Yesterday I was walking down the rail trail. And a dude comes at me, got a Gilligan's Island hat on, <laughs> sunglasses, and a goatee, gray goatee. So he's coming up on me. He's trucking along on a, on a mountain bike. <laughs> getting closer, getting closer, getting closer, getting closer. I, I sidestep. I got Charles with me. I sidestep and go by. Dunlap. Yo, yo, what's up? This morning I was out walking. And here he comes. He's walking. So he's going two a days. Oh really? Oh yeah. Was he breaking down film on his device while he no, was walking? I did, I did talk to him about that. We had a conversation about the spur back. Conversation about the spur back. He told a great story. Did he diagram a play for he you? He told a great story that he would never tell publicly that would indict previous coaches here, and I'll just leave it at that. But, but it was really interesting. He's got more than one of those. <laughs> All right, we're out. Where's the time go? That's it for this edition. Special thank you to Ronnie Everhart. Episode number 195 brought to us by Comax Business Systems. Your full-service Konica Minolta dealer. Go to Comax Business Systems at ComaxWV.com. By Burdette Camping Center, the only warranty forever RV dealer in all of West Virginia. Visit them at BurdetteCamping.com. 
buy three guys gear by going to the number three, then the words guys podcast, three guys podcast, and look cool. And buy three guys tattoos. By the way, are you going to go with any new, we got a request for a gray item. Are you going to do gray? We will at some point. Market's not ready for it yet. <laughs> Market's not ready for anything. <laughs> yeah. Our special thank you to our producer engineer, Daniel Woods, for Let's Hoppy, wait. for the Senator. We're back on Thursday with something else. Thank you very much for listening. Something Three else. guys before the game. See you all.